boring, a little repetitious to the description. We want to get right into the action, so I cut it out. So Campbell says, well, why don't you write the other part? He says, well, Ford says, I didn't rewrite it so much. That's corrected your spelling. John, you're a horrible speller. Well, then uh, Campbell decided to ask a few more questions. He says, now the illustration that accompanied the story, how, how is that decision made? So Ford says, well, if there's time, and there usually isn't any time, because we all have deadlines to meet, I give the manuscript to a writer, to the artist, and he picks out a scene to illustrate. But more often, I do the picking. I read the story, type the paragraphs, so describing what the action is, who the characters are, and it's illustrated, what size is to be, and so on. And Campbell says, well, after you do all this correcting on the manuscript, what happens next? So we send it down to the printer to set up the pipe, and it comes back to us. And Mort says at that point, we check it over to make sure there are no typographical errors, and we use certain marks to indicate what's to be corrected and so on. Uh, well, Campbell, well, this went on for about an hour or so, then Campbell said, I, I have to ask you one more question. In Filling Wonder Stories, there, there are always 160 pages. How do you manage to have it come out even? So Mort says, that's the easiest thing of all. When I select the stories and have a wide variety, whatever pages are left, I run letters from the readers. Well, Campbell smiled, stood up, and said, Mort, pat it up on his shoulder, said, Mort, I want to thank you for what you're doing. I want you to be the first to know I've just been made editor of Astounding Stories, and I had no idea what an editor know, does. Now, thanks to you, I know. <laughs> I got so excited when I told her to drop it. Hope you're enjoying it. I am doing it tomorrow. Oh, okay, thanks. All right, so that's the story about Campbell, learned how to become an editor. And as I mentioned, uh, the uh, Newark meeting was looking over a copy of Swilling really Wonder to see what more was up to. Walt was a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant. And of course, he remade DC Comics with his uh, Superman and Batman and all those things. Now, this is Walt's boss, Leo Margulies, who was the editorial director of the, uh, the uh, magazine. They all had the way of thrilling. Thrilling Detective, Thrilling Mystery, Thrilling Love, Thrilling West, and so on. The fellow on the far left is Fonz Royce Wright, who was the editor of Weird Tales. I don't want to get too much of that because their voice is giving out. This is sort of the weird element. The fellow next to him was an artist who drew for weird deals, C.C. Senth. Here is a, uh, a meeting in the weird deals office. The fellow in the white shirt again. The, the fellow on the left is the business manager, Spengler. The fellow in the middle is Father and Bright again. The fellow next to him is Henry Cutler, one of the uh, best all time weird fantasy science fiction writers. And the fellow on the far right is Robert Block again, the way. Uh, <clears throat> now some artists, this is Frank R. Paul, who many consider the definitive science fiction artist. He did all the covers for Gage Bank. This is in this office about 19, 19, uh, 35, 36. This is H.W. Wesso, who drew covers for the astounding stories back in those days. Uh, his real name was Hans Waldemir Wessolowski, but he always signed it Wesso, and he always had a special signature, and they had him duplicated on the lower left of Schwartz and Weisinger. The lady on his, on the, seated down as his wife. I must tell you, Wesso was not only a remarkable artist, he was even more remarkable. He had a glass eye, he had a glass eye. The fellow on the far left is a fan named Willis Conover Jr., still alive today. He does the voice of American uh, broadcast to Europe. And the fellow who he's helping stand up, so to speak, is Rachel Finlay, one of the great all-time fantasy artists. This is Ed Cartier, another famous fantasy artist, working for the State Smith magazines. Now I have a few writers. This is Ray Cummings, a uh, uh, painting done by his daughter. Ray Cummings, who was writing science fiction in the early 20s. I believe he was the first one to do a story in which you shrunk in size into atomics, into an atom below us. And I think that opening story is called The Girl in the Golden Atom. He wrote for a good 15 to 20 years. Not a very good writer, but Boston Science Fiction. This is Victor Russo, who wrote many science fiction back in the early days, including the story of the place of Stanley. His real name was Victor Russo Emanuel. I wish I could tell you more stories about these people, I just don't have time. This is probably the most famous fantasy writer of all. I did a horrible photograph, I apologize. This is A. Merritt. A. Merritt not only wrote science fiction and fantasy, he was the editor of the American Weekly, a supplement to the rest of those papers, making something like $75,000 a year in the Depression days of the 30s. I tell you, when his name appeared on Argosy, the circulation doubled. The only one else who could do that was Edgar Rice Burroughs. 
This is Eric Temple Bell, professor of mathematics at Caltech University. Loved science fiction, and he wanted to write it, but he had to write it under a pen name. He didn't want the people at Caltech to know what he's doing. He wrote many science fiction novels in the 20s and 30s. His name, uh, soon it was John Tame. This is John Tame. This is the most popular science fiction writer of the late 20s and the early 30s, Dr. David H. Kellum, also wrote for Weird Tales, but he was quoted the most uh, popular science fiction writer of the day. This is Edward E. Smith, also known as Doc Smith, who wrote the Skylark stories, the uh, Galactic Lens stories, and so on. Uh, he was a PhD. I once asked him, what does the doctor stand for? And he told me, Doctor of Donuts. <laughs> because he invented, he had a chemical formula that uh, made better donuts than anybody else. This is Murray Leinster. His real name was Will F. Jenkins. He wrote uh, stories for the Slick magazines that loved to write science fiction for a low rate, and he used the name Murray Leinster. Many people mispronounce his name as Murray Leinster, but I once asked him, how do you pronounce his name? He said, Leinster, as in Fenster. That's how I remember. This is a young Henry Cutner. Just starting out in uh, uh, science fiction and weird tales. I was his agent too. And uh, he once wrote a letter to uh, C.L. Moore, who wrote a uh, series of stories about uh, Northwest Smith and weird tales. Wrote Moore, liked, liked the stories, and uh, complimented the writer. Well, Moore wrote back, C.L. Moore wrote back, and said, It is Miss Moore, Miss Catherine L. Moore. And they uh, had a correspondence back and forth. Now, uh, Catherine Moore lived in uh, Indianapolis, and uh, whenever uh, Catherine drove across town, or, uh, across country, he stopped in Indianapolis and, uh, and have a nice little chat and took it in dinner, things like that. Now, C.L. Moore not only wrote stories about Northwest Smith taking place in the 21st century, but she wrote a series of stories, what are called now, so and sorcery taking place in about the 15th century. And Hank had an idea how he could wake both those characters into the same story and would have liked to collaborate with Moore on it. Uh, at first, she was reluctant to agree to do it, so he wrote one chapter, she wrote another, he wrote one, she wrote another. And the collaboration was so perfect, they continued the collaboration and they got married. Uh, and I'm talking about C.L. Moore, here she is. Very beautiful woman. Unfortunately, she died a year or two ago of Alzheimer's disease. He's also a guest of honor in the convention, uh, World Science Fiction Convention in 83, or 82, I believe it was, in Denver. This is Arthur J. Briggs, one of the uh, king of the pulps, I guess you would call him. He probably saw more pulp, pulp stories than anyone else. Uh, he would sit, uh, what Weising and I challenged him. Uh, he, I said to him, like the crazy old story, where do you get your ideas? Every science fiction convention, whenever a writer's on a panel, they say, where do you get your ideas? And the standard answer now is as follows. When we're out of ideas, we write a letter to a post office in Schenectady, we close a few dollars, and then someone up in Schenectady sends back the ideas. And that's where we get ideas, from a post office in Schenectady. <laughs> but Brake, Brake says, no, I get my ideas looking around the room or even opening uh, the dictionary and stabbing my finger at a word and I write a story around it. So Mort and I said, okay, we'll put it to the test. So Mort opened up the dictionary, I hit the word fan, so Brake sat down, proceeded to write, a story called Slaves of the Electric Fan. And he finished the story right in front of us, and it sold somewhere, so in a way. It's just absolutely prolific and terrific. This is Raymond Zubaloon, who is uh, still alive, he's about 80 years old. If you ever get a chance, he wrote a, a monumental classic story in 1934 called Old Faithful. Still a wonderful read. This is Donald Wandry, who not only wrote for the Weird Tales magazine, but also for Stanley. And he was a very good friend of H.P. Lovecraft. And he, along with August Thaler, founded a uh, publication uh, house called Arkham House, with a lot of the uh, fantasy writers. It was through Donald Wandright that I met the next fellow I will show you in a moment. Uh, a friend of his was coming to town, and he was throwing a party for him, and would I like to attend? So I said, sure. And I'll show you who this fellow is. This is H.P. Lovecraft. H.P. Lovecraft. I hope you all know, this year, he was alive, he would have been 100 years old, and to honor his 100th birthday at the World Fantasy Convention this year in Chicago, early part of November, we are celebrating the birthday of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, Robert Block will be one of the guests, Els Spragley Camp will be one of the guests, and I will be one of the guests. And I probably will be the only one at the convention who can say, I'm the only one here who ever met H.P. Lovecraft. Everybody else is dead.
unfortunately. What a few are left alive and no one at the convention. Now, he was a very serious fellow, and I'm often asked, well, what kind of a fellow was he described? I must tell you, at this party, I was about 18 or 19 years old, and I talked to him briefly as he leaned against the wall, he towered over me, and if I knew that 55 years later, you folks would ask me what was H.P. Lovecraft like, I would have paid more attention. <laughs> now, serious as Lovecraft was, and the stories and the demeanor, this is him horsing around with his best friend, Frank Dollar Long. It's hard to believe that H.P. Lovecraft would do a thing like that, sort of punching each other out. This, of course, is at the Rice Burrows. I don't think I have to tell you much about him, except in the case of Otis Adam Klein, who was a rival of Edgar Rice Burrows. Now, if Edgar Rice Burrows wrote a story about Mars, as he often wanted to do, Otis Adam Klein wrote a story about Venus. But the airport, Burrows wrote a story about Venus, so Klein says, OK, be a wise I'll write a story about Mars, which he proceeded to do. And then Burroughs started to write stories about Tarzan of the Apes. And Klein says, OK, I'll write stories about Jan and the Jungle. And this went back and forth. Uh, he was not quite a good writer as uh, Andy Rice Burroughs, but he, he wrote pretty good stuff. He appeared in Augustine and Weird Tales. Also, once in a while, for me. <clears throat> this is Arthur C. Clarke. I don't think I can say much more about him. Still alive, uh, not best of health. Uh, I guess if I was once asked in a telephone interview who were the three most popular writers of, uh, of science fiction, and I said ABC. <laughs> and the answer was Asimov. B. Who would it be? Bradbury, of course. And C. for Clark. This is John Russell Frame, very popular writer of science fiction back in the 30s. Uh, he had what has been estimated at least 50 pen names. Two of them, which I re I was his agent too. Uh, two of the names were Polk and Cross and Thornton. Those are the ones I represented. He did not reveal to me they were pseudonyms for John Russell Frame. I found that out later. He didn't want me to know. This is that Eric Frank Russell I told you about, who I sold the story. Now he wrote a, I was just agent, he wrote a story that was absolutely, absolutely great. It's called Forbidden Nakeds. I could hardly wait to bring it up to John W. Campbell, because I know he'd love it. I brought it up to Campbell, I said, I have Eric Frank Russell's greatest story. Uh, he said, well, I'll be glad to read it. I went back the next week, I said, well, how'd you like Russell's story? He says, I can't use it, can't use it. I said, what? It's, it's a masterpiece. He says, I gotta tell you, I said, let me finish, I said, I can't use it in astounding stories. But it's such a wonderful story. It's strictly not science fiction, it's more fantasy. I'm going to start a new magazine called Unknown. And the first story in that book, if anyone who collects Unknown, is Sinister Barrier. Campbell changed the title from Forbidden Nakers to Sinister Barrier. And had Eric Frank Russell, one of the best writers. If you have a chance, go back and meet Eric. He's now uh, passed away, but he's a wonderful, wonderful writer. This is Neil R. Jones, recently elected to the first fan of Hall of Fame. Uh, he wrote a series of stories about uh, Professor James, and very popular and amazing stories. This is P. Scarlett Miller. I was his agent too, wrote many fine stories. Wound up as the, <coughs> excuse me, as the uh, book reviewer for John W. came on the style. This is Bob Tucker again. A book of his has just been reissued called, uh, uh, I think, The Year of the Year of the Something Sun, of the Explosion. Year of what? Year of the Quiet Sun. Year of the Quiet Sun, right? Considered by many one of the best times traveling novels ever written. Uh, I attended a meeting uh, uh, in uh, New York called Lunacar, and a number of first fandom members got together, so I thought we'd all take a picture to see how we look today. The fellow on the left is Kenneth Sterling, who had a couple of stories printed in uh, one of the possibly details. They were rewritten by H.P. Lovecraft. The fellow next to him is Art Saha, who was the editor of the uh, uh, world, best, uh, world fantasy stories, I guess they call it. He's the president of the first fandom. Next to him is Donald A. Wallheim, writer, editor, and publisher. Next to him is me. The, the lady below them is Donna Wallheim's wife. The fellow next to me standing is Bob Tucker. The fellow holding on to Elsie Wallheim is Isaac Asimov. And on the far right is another popular science fiction writer named 